The explorers of Australia did it for many motives. Some were hungry for land. Some were hungry for fame. Some regarded themselves as men of destiny. And some were driven by a sense of duty or a thirst for knowledge. In the race to cross Australia from the south coast to the north coast in 1860, the major motive was something else, direct intercolonial rivalry. Both Victoria and South Australia wanted the glory of launching the first expedition to travel the continent from sea to sea. Their heroes, Stuart from South Australia and Burke and Wills from Victoria, found themselves locked in a race to the finish. Crossing the continent from south to north was no easy task. Gallant men had already been beaten back from the centre of Australia. Eyre, in 1840, was blocked by what he thought was an impassable horseshoe lake north of the Flinders Ranges. Another expedition set out from Adelaide four years later, led by Captain Sturt. Sturt set out to explore the centre of Australia, but wherever he went, he was forced to retreat. To the west were salt pans. To the north, endless desert. But he did find one place of permanent water. He called it Cooper's Creek. Twelve years after Sturt's heartbreaking expedition, the skilled explorer Augustus Gregory exploded one of the great myths of the interior. Gregory found that there was no horseshoe lake only a chain of separate salt pans with possible tracks between them. John McDowell Stewart, a tough little Scots-born surveyor, soon followed up this discovery. Stewart had been with Captain Sturt on the desert expedition. He learned something from it, and his own expeditions had no cumbersome drays and slow herds. He relied only on horses, and he kept moving. Stuart threaded a way up past Marie, through the gap between Lake Torrens and Lake Eyre, opening the way to the north. When the South Australian government offered a cash prize of 2,000 pounds to the first expedition to break through to the northern coast of Australia, Stuart confidently pushed out with only two companions, William Keckwick and Ben Head. In 1860, he reached what's now the Northern Territory and named the great monolith Chambers Pillar for one of the pastoralists who financed his expeditions. He named the Fink River for his other patron. He named the Macdonald Ranges for the governor of South Australia. 200 kilometres north of Alice Springs, Stuart found the centre of Australia, which so many had speculated and dreamed about, and found it was neither a desert nor an inland sea, but a lightly grassed plain. It had been the heart's desire of Captain Sturt to find this spot, and Stuart honoured his old commander by naming the nearest mountain, Central Mount Sturt. Three cheers for Captain Sturt the father of Australian exploration. Hip hip, hooray! hooray. Hip hip, hooray. hooray! Hip hip, hooray. hooray! And one more for Mrs. Sturt and family. Hooray. hooray! Let this be a sign to the natives that the dawn of liberty, civilization, and Christianity is about to break upon them. Captain Sturt was deprived of the honor intended for him. The mountain went down on the map as Central Mount Stewart. Stuart's notion of the blessings he was bringing to the natives was another mistake. 
although it was a typical 19th century explorer's statement. The natives preferred their own version of liberty, civilization, and religion. At a place called Attack Creek, the Aborigines fired the grass and rained boomerangs on Stuart's party. Stuart made a decision. I have most reluctantly come to the determination to abandon the attempt to meet the Gulf of Carpentaria. I think it would be madness and folly to attempt more. If my own life was the only sacrifice, I would willingly risk it to attempt my purpose. But it seems that I'm destined to be disappointed. Man proposes, but the Almighty disposes, and his will must be obeyed. It was the end of June, 1860. Stuart did not reach Adelaide with his news till October. He had solved one of the great mysteries of the world, the nature of the centre of Australia. It was ranked with the discovery of the source of the Nile. And this remarkable achievement, with just two companions, won him the gold medal of the Royal Geographical Society in London. Meanwhile, great things were happening in Melbourne. Inspired by the confidence of gold, Victoria was determined to do what it had never done before, to launch an exploring expedition to cross Australia from south to north. This expedition established several firsts. It was the first Victorian expedition, the first to make major use of camels, specially imported from India, and the first to have such lavish backing over 9,000 pounds from the Victorian government and the Exploration Committee. And it was the first to have a leader whose total exploring experience was nil. Robert O'Hara Burke was an Irish police superintendent on the goldfields. Why he volunteered as leader and why the Exploration Committee chose him remains a mystery. The surveyor appointed to chart the expedition's track was William Wills an earnest young man from Devon who was to become Burke's right-hand man. The departure of the Burke and Wills expedition from the Royal Park, Melbourne, was the greatest spectacle, or as some put it, the greatest circus ever seen in that city. 18 men, 23 horses, 27 camels, and wagons with 21 tons of stores and equipment to last a year, slowly moved out of the city and across Victoria. The best of everything, from rockets and colt revolvers, to brandy, preserved fruit and vegetables, even firewood. Stuart was already out in the center with his horses, and Burke was going up to race him with his camels. Melbourne Punch made the most of this intercolonial challenge. A race, a race, so great a one, the world ne'er saw before. A race, a race across this land, from south to northern shore. The horseman hails from Adelaide, the camel rider ours. Now let the steed maintain his speed against the camel's powers. Burke's plan was to strike north from the known permanent water of the Darling at Menindee to the known permanent water at Cooper's Creek, and then directly to the known rivers of the Gulf. Burke was keen to win the race and impatient at any delay. Wills tried to restrain Burke, but he also knew that Victoria expected them to win the race. When there were problems organizing supplies at Menindee, Burke and Wills decided to dash ahead with an advance party. Here at Cooper's Creek, Burke spent five frustrating weeks waiting for the rest of his men and stores to arrive. But bureaucratic bungling by the Exploration Committee delayed their departure from Menindee. Burke could wait no longer. His patience snapped on the 16th of December, and leaving four men at Cooper's Creek, 
He set out with Wills, John King, Charlie Gray, and three months' supplies. In that time, he hoped to walk to the Gulf and return to Cooper's Creek. Both Victoria and South Australia wanted the glory of launching the first expedition to travel the continent from sea to sea. Their heroes, Stuart from South Australia and Burke and Wills from Victoria, found themselves locked in a race to the finish. Some regarded themselves as men of destiny, and some were driven by a sense of duty or a thirst for knowledge. In the race to cross Australia from the south coast to the north coast in 1860, the major motive was something else, direct intercolonial rivalry. The explorers of Australia did it for many motives. Some were hungry for land. Some were hungry for fame. Crossing the continent from south to north was no easy task. Gallant men had already been beaten back from the centre